Colossians chapter 1, if you have your Bibles, um, we'll be there um, at some point in the course of the day. I did want to address one announcement I forgot because I've already had numerous questions about a mother's room. We will have a mother's room, probably not next week, but hopefully by January 6th. The mother's room will be right through these walls. If you could walk through these walls and you can't, if you can walk through these walls, let me know. I'd like to meet you. But, um, but there's rooms and there's doors on both sides. And it's a very, actually very large room back there that will be sectioned off for moms that need to feed the children and a family room. We'll have two flat screens in there so you can watch the service. And, and the coffee shop over here will be open hopefully by January 6th with two flat screens. You'll be able to sit in there and watch the service too. It'll, it'll all be fed. So we understand a picture of the whole thing. Now that, that funny, I love the shallow thoughts um, from a, no, a deep thought from a shallow Christian videos. There's a hundreds of them out there. But I, I, I chose that one because it talked about the living water. And the Word of God is full of really profound and incredible promises like this one. Let, let me read you John 7, verse 38. It says this, Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the Scripture declares, rivers of living water will flow from his heart. Well, that's, who believes that? Look at that. Some of you, happy, a, a quarter of you believe it. Um, anyone else believe it but you quarter? The rest are just here for the most. Okay. Um, now, who, who, who is, um, it's Sunday, it's church. Um, who experiences that? Two, three, four. All right. All right. Some of you. All right, good. So, so what we're saying, what, the point I'm getting here is so what we believe and what we experience is sometimes different, isn't it? And sometimes we can look at these, these lofty promises from the Word of God, yet these, and we know they're promises and we believe them to be true, but they, they sort of escape us on day-to-day, moment-by-moment moment moment lives. I had somebody say, um, Pastor Kelly, I like the stuff that you preach on, cause it, but, but it's all that theology stuff. You've you got to make it more practical. Well, you're right. And the, and the Jews asked the same question, really, of Moses and of God. We've got to make this more practical. Give us a list of things to do. Teach us how to, how to modify our behavior. Teach, teach us how to act like good Jews. And that's all we've got to do is act like good Jews. They'll be easy. And we know how that turned out. It didn't turn out that well. What, what do you think? It's a few questions to ponder on as we dive in. What do you think will make God pleased with your life? Well, don't answer me. Too many people will yell at one time. But just what do you think will make God pleased with you? As you sit here, you're driving to church. What, you think God's pleased with you because you're in church? Well, I think he's pleased that you're in this church, yeah. I'm pleased that you're in this church. Thank you for being here. Do you think he's pleased with you because you maybe read your Bible this morning? You think he's pleased with you because you prayed, maybe, or prayed for somebody, or with somebody, or for somebody, or toward somebody, or something like that? You think he's pleased with you because you left a track in the men's room? Because I just saw one in there. Chances are we're already saved, whoever left it. (laughs) But let me tell you a secret. If you go into a a restaurant restroom with a track, you take, roll the toilet paper out, Put a track in the toilet paper, roll it back up. So when they pull the toilet paper, the track flies right out at them. I guarantee they'll read it. I guarantee they'll read it. Sean's watched before. They read it. They, I'm, all, <laughs> I'm kidding with you. So, so, so we, we, we want this little list. Now, I, I believe there's two things that keep people from... Could, maybe you, can, you have a bigger list than me. Keep people from really experiencing authentic Christian, having a, an authentic Christian experience. Number one is not really dwelling on and thinking about that, that right there, the cross of Jesus Christ. Most do not understand the cross of Jesus Christ. You go to some places, they'll teach you how to have a good marriage, how to communicate, how to be more prosperous and all these different things, but they'll leave the cross of Jesus Christ out of their message. There was a ministry a few years back that did a big study, they, and I appreciate the ministry. They, they evaluated, very mega church, they evaluated their fruit over 15 years. And they found out that after 15 years of teaching and bringing many people to Christ, that, that they had failed tremendously in bringing people into spiritual maturity. 
and they did a whole study went on for six, seven, eight years on how, where did they fa fail in bringing people into spiritual maturity? I remember reading the first book and I was got to the very last chapter. Okay, now they're going to tell us how to get people to spiritual maturity. When it came to that question, they said, more research to follow. <laughs> then I screamed <laughs> and I yelled things I probably shouldn't have yelled. I judged them and I had to repent right after <laughs> because, because the, the problem wasn't with their programs. The problem, wasn't, the problem was with the message. The message of the cross is what lit the world on fire. The message of the cross is what changed lives. And then the second aspect, I think, which is um, lar largely ignored, probably because of fear and, and not ab being able to really wrap our arm arms around it, is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And I want to spend a good part of this morning talking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life. I'm going to give you a formula of how, to, how the Holy Spirit is going to work and transform you. No, I won't, but we'll see as we dive in. So the first point, is my Christian life one of participation or imitation? Important point. Am I participating in my Christian life with the Spirit of God, or am I imitating, potentially, Jesus Christ? Thomas Kempis, so many of you heard of him. He wrote his, his classic work, The Imitation of Christ, I think in the 14th century. The Imitation of Christ was um, probably the most read Christian book next to the Bible in history. And in essence, what he was writing about in that book, he was writing about some of the monasteries and some of the things that people were doing at the day, trying to act like Jesus. So he spoke about the imitation of Christ. He wasn't really in, um, validating what they were doing. He was just writing about a little bit of the futility of what they were doing. You look today in certain societies and in the early centuries of the church, and people would walk upstairs on their knees, like huge stairways, so their knees were bloody because they thought that physical pain would purge them and make them more like Jesus. There are people in 2012 that in, in certain countries that will allow themselves to be physically crucified and nailed to a cross so they can imitate Jesus. What a bummer when they get to heaven and realize none of it really mattered. See, we're not called to imitate Jesus. We're called to participate with him, to share his life. Today we wear bracelets out there that says WWJD. What would Jesus do? Not against it. Anyone have a, a WWJD bracelet on? Don't admit it because I'm about to hit it. <laughs> no, he wouldn't wear that thing. And um, w, what would Jesus do? Well, that's, that's good. What would Jesus do? That's a good question. But can you do what Jesus do? Can you do what Jesus did, I should say? <laughs> Got my tenses mixed up there. I mean, can, can you really live a Christ-like life? Like he did? If you can, I'm stepping down, you're stepping up, because you're the new pastor. Because I don't believe that we can. Now last week, in Matthew chapter 5, let me, let me show you how impossible Jesus made this. You have heard, this is Matthew 5, verse 21. You have heard for, that our ancestors were told, you should not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. But I say, Jesus saying, I say, if you are angry, angry with somebody, you're subject to judgment. So don't kill anyone, but I'm going to up the ante here. If you're angry with somebody, if you call somebody an idiot, that's the New Living Translation, I'm not saying that. Um, if you call somebody an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court, and if you curse somebody, you're in danger of the fires of hell. Wow. Let's close. <laughs> so... So I, I, I read that, and I say, wow, I, you know, I can probably not do the, um, the murder thing. I can probably, in verse 22 or 27, I can, I can do the do not commit adultery thing. I can probably do that. I fear God. I fear Peggy. And, um, and, and so I, I, I can probably do that, but, but I'm not sure I can do the thinking thing. I'm not sure that I can ever not call somebody an idiot, at least in my mind. I may, not, I may have a very controlled Christian tongue that doesn't utter it out, but in my mind, when that person cuts me off on US-19, me, me being a perfect driver, I, I, um, I, 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 might call them, I might call them an idiot, at least silently, between me and 
myself and I. <laughs> so so for, for me to think that I can live the Christian life how he described it, it's impossible. Yet many Christians, me included, we live a Christian life and we design a Christian life that's to be lived or attempted to be lived without the Holy Spirit. And it's impossible. It becomes a law. It becomes a list. A bunch of thou shalt, thou shalt not. You better, you oughta, you coulda. Or as Everett Ferris said, God is good, I am bad, try harder. <laughs> Always love that. Let me read you, read you Matthew chapter 11, verse 27. This this preamble into verse 28, 29, and 30, which we talk about quite a bit. I, I think they're very key verses for us to embrace. Jesus resumed talking to the people, but now tenderly. He says, the Father has given me all these things to do and say. This is a, a unique father and son operation. Coming out of the father and son intimacies and knowledge. Let's just stay there for a moment because what's being, what he's saying here, what Jesus is saying to his disciples is, is pretty powerful. He's saying, I have a relationship with the father that's not matched on earth. And the, relation, and the father has a relationship with me that's all supernatural. Men cannot have relationship with the father like I do. Men cannot have relationship with each other like I have with the Father. There's a supernatural inspired relationship between Jesus the Son and God the Father. No one knows the Son the way the Father does. I think we'd all agree to that. Nor the Father the way the Son does. But I'm not keeping it to myself. Look what he says here. I'm ready to go over it line by line. With anyone that will listen. You know what Jesus has invited me to? He invited me to participate in his relationship with the Heavenly Father. He didn't exhort me to imitate anything. He didn't tell me to be or do a thing. He didn't tell me how to act. He didn't tell me how to behave. He didn't tell me how to speak or not to speak. He just extended an invitation. You can have what I have. You can participate in this relationship, exclusive relationship that I have with the Father. Now we know something that, different terms that we like to use here. I just lost my page because I missed it. Oh, there it is, I found it again. Is um, called the exchange life. And, um, and we call it the grace message, the gospel, um, spiritual transformation. There's a bunch of buzzwords. I call it the exchange life. That's sort of where I, I like because that's what I believe it is. Now, most of you know Romans chapter 7. We've talked about Romans 7 before. And as you know, Paul has a recorded struggle there. He struggles with, with sin that had its home in his physical body. He, he's at the end of his mental emotional rope, if I can use that term, when he burst out, he has these great feelings in this verse, I want to read you, but before I read you verse 24, which I have on the screen, I was reading the verses leading up to it earlier, let me read you those first on the, from the scriptures here, let's see if I can find them. I have discovered this principle of life, and what I want to do is, what I want to do, what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. He's trying to imitate I love God, I love God's law with all my heart. But there's another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to sin that is still within me. And that's where I pick up verse 24. Because in, in the King James it says this, O wretched man that I, that I am. In the Living Translation he says, O miserable man that I am. This is not soft language. This is strong language in the Greek New Testament. This is a man bellowing from his inner, inner being and, and yelling, oh, what a wretched man am I. You know why he's wretched? Because he's not doing a good job imitating Christ. The things that he wants to do, he doesn't do. 
The things that he knows he's, he's supposed to be doing, he's not doing them. The things he's, he's not supposed to be doing, he finds himself doing them. Outwardly? Maybe. Inwardly? For sure. Outwardly, maybe we can conform this old, old body of sin into something that, that acts right. Hey, let's face it sometimes. Sometimes we get so old, guys, we don't want to sin anymore. Way too much energy. I got to do what? Oh, never mind. I'll just take a nap. <laughs> I'm too old for that type of sin. Forget that. <laughs> Somebody had to help me. <laughs> just, just wheel me over there. I'll do something, but I don't know. <laughs> and um, some of us are just too old. I'm just, I've, out, I've outgrown sin. I haven't really outgrown it. I just get too old to do it. <laughs> and, and, and so, so uh, that's, that's, we're not talking about that. We're, not, we're talking about a, a in a, internal thing. Paul's saying, look at even if I stop doing those things, and I'm believing he did, I still have this Matthew chapter 5 experience. I'm still looking with lust. I still have murder in my heart. My heart is not lined up with my actions. I can teach my body to imitate Christ while my heart never participates with him. I can teach my outward actions to act like a good Christian and function well within the arena of churchianity without my heart really ever being engaged in a spirit. So Paul has this battle. What a wretched man am I. He found himself at a point of crisis. And that's a key word. And I pray today by the end of this service that some of you with me will allow yourselves to be brought to a point of crisis and how we'll define it today. Because I don't believe we get the real deal unless we come to a point of crisis. Let me define crisis for you. Webb's is 1823. says the decisive state of things. Or a point of time when an affair to arrive, when an affair is arrived to its height, and soon must soon terminate or suffer material change. So it's a decisive state. In a sense, it's at a pinnacle. You're at a place where you're going to go one way or the next, one direction or the other direction. You're at a point of crisis. What am I going to do with this crisis? Am I going to live this life imitating? Christian behavior, or am I going to live this life participating in the very life of Christ within me? Am I going to seek the things of churchianity or embrace true Christianity and participate in a Christian life, real Christian life, New Testament Christian life? Which is it going to be? It is a decision. I would venture to say that if we have not been brought to this place, and some haven't, for numerous reasons. First, you haven't lived long enough. That's the first thing. Just hang on. Life will catch up with you, and you'll be a mess. <laughs> when I was a young man, I got saved when I was 19, out of the world. I was the first Christian in my home, and I got busy for Jesus. I mean, I was just busy. I just got busy. I went soul winning my first couple months. I went out passing out tracks in the mall, threw up a few times. I was so scared, but I, but I, but I, but I, and then we went evangelizing. Six months later, I was in Bible college studying the scriptures and, um, and studying to do what I'm doing today. I was energetic, morning, noon, and night. My wife will tell you, we we're both the same way. We met my wife. We would go to nursing home on Mondays, visitation on Tuesdays, church on Wednesdays, something on Thursdays. I think I played baseball Fridays and bus ministry on Saturdays and all day Sunday. And I couldn't, couldn't have, I was just great. I loved what I was doing. The only thing I loved more was judging the people who wasn't doing as much as I was. <laughs> yeah. That was actually a little bit more fun <laughs> than actually doing what I was doing. <clears throat> and I was just real excited. And, and then the 20s come and then the 30s come. And, and I'm thinking, you know, um, is this real? I mean, I, 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 I preach about joy. Do I have joy? I should scream about the peace that goes beyond understanding, but do I have peace that goes beyond understanding? I can quote you 1 Corinthians 2.14, he's caused me to triumph, but do I triumph? Is the power of God real in my life? Or is it just, a, as Ezekiel says, a lovely song? 
Something that we can sing, appreciate, but never really attain. So somewhere I come, you get to this point of this crisis. Dr. Charles Solomon, who, who is um, the author of Exchange Life Counseling and, and wrote numerous books on m- numerous subjects, he says that point of crisis usually happens about 40 years old, 35 to 45 years old. It's just sort of coincides with the midlife crisis. <laughs> and, it's, um, and it says because usually the first 15 or 20 years you're a Christian, you're, going, you're just doing everything. You're operating on the energy of religion. You're operating on the energy of churchianity. You're, op- you're operating on the energy of mission. There's a great movement in, in Christianity today on the purpose of mission. Our younger generation, and I appreciate this to a large degree, they're, they're mission-based, mission-oriented. Give us something to sink our teeth into. Give us a mission trip to go to. Let's jump on buses and go to New York and help Hurricane Sandy people. Let's go to a, a third world and build houses for people who don't have houses. Let's do these great things for God. Let's do wonderful things for God. And that's awesome and that's wonderful. And the church needs to be the church that way. However... Does that make you any more spiritual, any more godly, any more Christ-centered than somebody who may be physically unable to do that? It's not about imitating Christ. It's about participating with Him through the Holy Spirit. That's New Testament Christianity. When the Holy Spirit came into the church in Acts chapter 2, everything changed. They went into the fire. They were like a fire that went into all the world. The Holy Spirit didn't catch them when they went out. The Holy Spirit propelled them out. They didn't go. They stayed. They got the Spirit. Then they went. And they turned the world upside down. Sometimes there's no real hunger for the things of God. I get that. What I'm saying here is like, that's great. But there's no real hunger for the things of God. You'll never experience really the transformation I'm talking about. Sometimes Jesus is our Savior. He's just not our Lord. I believe Him for salvation and eternal life, but I haven't believed Him for governorship of my life. At some point, my friends, I believe we have a crisis where I look at my Christian life and I say, I don't want my churchianity to continue to replace my Christianity. This is part of our growth. I understand that. But our faith and walks with God is encouraged here, endorsed here, helped here, but not created here. That's you and the Lord. I believe this crisis that I'm talking about is when I come to a place where I say, God, I... I need the real thing. I don't need phony or fake anymore. I I can no longer go through the outward motions without having it come from an inward participation. I can no longer just keep acting like a Christian and performing like a Christian. I want to actually know the peace that goes beyond understanding. I want to actually know joy that's unspeakable. I want the real deal. I don't want a social gospel, a social relationship with Christ. I don't want a cultural relationship with Christ. I want a personal, intimate relationship with Christ where it's me and Jesus and we know each other and we participate through His Holy Spirit in His life and it's personal and it's intimate and it's nothing to do with this building, nothing to do with the local assembly. It's me and Jesus that helps me be the wife that I need to be, the husband that I need to be, the man that I need to be, the child that I need to be. It gives me a passion for the lost, a passion to help others. It gives me a love that goes beyond knowledge, a peace that goes beyond understanding, a joy that's unspeakable. That's the, that's the life that I want. And I'm not going to get that necessarily from a sermon. I'm going to get that alone with God, me and Him, alone, starkly honest, and me seeking and knocking on this door saying, God, I want the very best that you have for me in here. That's how it happens. <clears throat> Here's a small dose of, of the scriptural um, of validation of what I'm saying. Let me read Colossians 1 verse 25. It says this, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship of God. I think I believe that's dispensation in the King James. That was given to me to make the word of God fully known. That word fully known is a word that means not just understanding it up here, 
but it's something I can practice, something that has ongoing authority in my life. The mystery hidden for the ages and generations, but now revealed to the saints. The mysteries that, excuse me, depending on who you read, some will say there's 14 mysteries in the scriptures. Some will say there's nine. I'm saying there's 10, just because I don't want to cause waves. <laughs> and, um, and we, but we know the primary mystery of the New Testament is defined in the next verse. And mystery is something, and mysterion is the Greek word, it means it's something that wasn't revealed before that is now being uncovered. He says this, To them God chose to make known, to them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of his majesty, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now here's the mystery. It's not a Jewish gospel anymore, he's saying. It goes out to the whole world. And the Old Testament prophets, they knew about it. They prophesied about it. Ezekiel prophesied in his, in his new covenant. Uh, Jeremiah prophesied about the new covenant. But now we, now we are living in the day they dreamed about and prayed for. 2 Peter 1, verse 3. His divine power has granted to us all things. His divine power. Now that word divine power there in the Greek New Testament is the word dunamai, and it talks about His Holy Spirit living in you. That's really what it refers to. It's the life of Christ. It's not this, it's not this outward zapping that comes out. There it is. No, it's something already here. It's participating in His life. That's His divine power. That's where the power comes from. It's me drawing my life from Him and not from myself. So his divine power has granted to us all the things that pertain on the life and godliness through the knowledge, same word, experiential knowledge, of him who called us to his own glory in excellence. And he says this, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises. 7,834 promises in the word of God. Somebody said. Mm -hmm. I never counted them. So that through them, these precious promises, watch what he says here, you can become what? Partakers, participants in his divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world, Romans 7, through sinful desire. Now this doesn't mean that you're becoming deified. That's not going to happen. If you're married, you just know it ain't going to happen. <laughs> it's just, it, it doesn't, mean, it doesn't mean like all of a sudden you become, uh, you have this divine nature in you at all. It doesn't refer to that at all. This word nature is the word phusis. I think is how you say it. If not, you, most of you probably don't know, so I'm safe. It's, um, it means, this, this is just, uh, I think, it's Luther's lexicon. The sum, the sum of innate properties and powers with, with, by which one person differs from others. So we're participants of his, his divine nature, his native peculiarity, the native peculiarity peculiarities of, of Christ, of, of God, natural characteristics of the Godhead, the natural strength of the Godhead, ferocity and the intractability of beast. Huh. Who wants the intractability of beast? That was just on the, yeah, some of you, some of you I don't even know what that means, I, but that was just part of the cut and paste, so there it was, I should have deleted it. So, so we, we are partakers of the qualities of God's nature. Now this is not some mystical thing in which I become partially divine, as we said, it is, it is a reflection of him outwardly through an identification with him on the inside. That's how it happens. Now, let me read you a quote by Barnes. He says, the meaning is this, commenting on this verse, that they who are renewed, that's you and I, become participants of the same moral nature, that is of the same and this is how he defines moral, of the same views, the feelings, and thoughts, purposes, and principles of actions. So we become, we become a participant of the same um, views of Christ, feelings of Christ, thoughts of Christ, purposes of Christ, and principles of actions of Christ. This other commentator, Gill, said this, Christ formed in the heart, commenting on this verse, into which image and likeness the saints are more and more changed from glory to glory. You're the saints. And his likeness were changed from glory to glory through the application of the gospel. Great statement. And the promises of the gospel by which they have, they have such sights of Christ 
as do transform them and assimilate them into him. So we're assimilated into Christ's nature. We're assimilated into his values, into his morals, into his ethics. We're, we're brought in and assimilated through a spiritual um, miracle of the indwelling spirit. And the resemblance will be perfected hereafter when they shall be entirely like him and see him as he is. So we're not perfect yet, he's saying. When he returns and we're glorified, we will be. But throughout this life, we're being consistently, in Romans 8, 29, conformed into his image. We're becoming more and more like Christ. Not because we, we have a list of things to do, but we're participating in his life. And just participating in his life on a daily, weekly, monthly basis starts this transformation process that goes on till we die. Then we become more and more like Jesus, then things like missions excites us because they excite Jesus. Forgiveness becomes easier because he forgives. Not judging people becomes relatively um, easier because he doesn't judge people. Loving unlovable people becomes attainable to me because he loves unlovable people. I'm not working this up in myself. I'm just getting out of the way, and his nature is being lived through me. I just learned to participate in his nature. You see how this works? This is a huge message. I don't know if I could preach a more important message for your Christian lives. To understand that it is not acting a certain way, behaving a certain way, becoming a certain thing. It's participating in a life that you have through the Holy Spirit. It's in you. If you're born again, you're sealed with the Spirit, Ephesians 4.30, to the day of redemption. That life's already in you. Let me define this identification, this union that Mildred Erickson defines in his, in his systematic theology. I, I, actually, I pieced it together. as a long quote. I took some of the stuff out. It is the union of spirits it is in some way a union of spirits that does not extinguish any, either of them. So you have a human spirit and the Holy Spirit, and somehow God brings them together, but they, but they don't extinguish the other. They don't dominate. They, they, they live in this unity. It's a union of spirits. Christ has designed and created our entire nature, including our psyches. It is not surprising that dwelling within us in some way, and this is important, that we fully don't understand he is able to affect our very thoughts and feelings. That's our, our union with Christ. That's our, our, our identification with Christ. He actually becomes part of us and begins affecting and impacting our thoughts and our feelings. It's mystical. I told you earlier I had a formula for you. I lied. <laughs> but I wanted to keep you here until after the offering anyway. <laughs> I'm kidding you. There is no formula for it. He alludes to this very important point that we, we are not able to really embrace. And we can't really figure it out. And we can't, my friends, listen to me. We can't apply it to our lives without the Holy Spirit. I wish I could give you A, B, C, 1, 2, 3, and apply this, but you can't. It, it needs a ministry of the Holy Spirit living in you. It's something that you have to be taught through Him to maybe... And, um, engulfing myself in the word of God which is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart in Hebrews 4 verse 12 so the spirit needs to teach me and show me the difference between true spirit transformation and self will behavioral modification it needs to reveal to me the difference between good works that stem from God's grace and good works that stem from God's mercy and God's transforming work in my life to what I'll call flesh works that come from a striving life in the arena of churchianity. He needs to show us those differences because sometimes they can be remarkably similar. How does he teach you these things? Well, I already sort of said that. How do we get to a place where this becomes real? You have to come to a point of crisis. Not like, oh no, pull the hair out of your head, that happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
yesterday. <laughs> it, it's not that type of crisis. It's when I come to a place, I'm sort of standing on a pinnacle, and I say, okay, God, where do I go from here? I've done this my way for a long time. I've done this, I've strived, I've been a good Christian, I've acted well, I've outgrown certain sins. <laughs> um, where do I go from here? Because I don't have joy unspeakable. I don't have peace that goes beyond understanding. I don't have a power that prevails in me. I can't control my thought life much. I don't have the affections of Jesus. I don't care about people or missions. I don't care any of those things. So those things don't excite me. So God, I, and what he's saying today that I can't really get those things without your Holy Spirit. So I come to a point of crisis where I say, God, I, I, I want it. I, I want it. If this is New Testament Christianity, I want it. I want the very best you have for me. I want it unadulterated. I, I understand there's a process, and I'm in the process my whole life, and I'm conformed to his image from now till I go home to glory when I'm actually like him at that point. But God, I'm giving you my life. This is what I want. How does that happen? Well, I've sort of already said that. Let me read you Hebrews 11, verse 6, and one more verse, and we'll close. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and watch what he says, and he is a rewarder of him that what? Diligently seek him. So I seek him. I seek him. Luke 11, verse 9, New Living Translation, brings out the tense pretty well here. And so I tell you, keep on asking, and, and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be opened. Now, you look at those verses sometimes if you're lonely and you say, God, I'm going to keep knocking and trusting you for the right husband or the right wife. And amen. I, God, I pray that God blesses you with that. God, I'm going to keep trusting. If you like Jeanette, I'm going to keep trusting and asking for the, for the, for the lotto numbers. <laughs> that didn't work too well for our list last week, but I was hoping it would, but it didn't. <laughs> and, and so, so you, but I'm going to keep knocking. I'm going to buy another ticket in your name and, um, and, 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 see, if, and see if that works. And, and that didn't work, obviously, for her. I tried to warn her against it. And <laughs> she bought me three. <laughs> but but um so and uh, God but I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna seek I'm gonna I'm gonna believe you and keep asking that you you deliver me from this addiction in my life how about that one I'm gonna believe you and keep asking you that you take this this pain of loneliness out this besetting sin whatever that besetting sin may be God I, I'm praying that you'll you'll heal those wounds from my past that was afflicted upon me as a helpless child, heal those wounds from my past. I'm seeking you for those things. My friends, my point is this. Don't seek those things. Seek Him. You seek Him. God, teach me how to participate in your life. Teach me how to have a life that's empowered by your Holy Spirit. The real deal. Because if I do that, I can combat loneliness. If I can do that, I can combat addiction. I can combat besetting sin. In fact, I don't have to worry about any of the outward stuff. If I can just participate with you in that same walk, that same work, that same relationship you have with the Father. We have a, I should say, I hope today, me included, that when we leave in the quiet place of our minds, when we're driving home tonight, tomorrow, the following days, that we have a bone of his bones crisis. That we say, God, I want the bone of your bones. I want your life in me. I want to participate with what you have with the Father. I want your Holy Spirit to teach me all those places where my flesh does it and you don't. I want your Holy Spirit to show me all those places where I'm still living by the law when I'm under grace. I'm trusting you. I'm seeking you. If you don't seek, the scriptures say, I probably won't find. I can't employ you enough and beg you enough as your pastor. Seek these things and watch what Jesus does in